He's good, huh? He's good. He's so good. Well, happy Mother's Day for all the mothers here today. Amen. Everyone here has got a mother, right? So happy Mother's Day, Lord. Well, have you ever felt like a third wheel? You know, some people don't even know uh, when they're treating other people like a third wheel or when they were the third wheel. You, you ever notice that? Have you ever been there? Well, I'm going to try to help you. I've got uh, a few things that, to help you figure this out. Like if your mom tells uh, you uh, that your older brothers and sisters have to take you somewhere, then you're probably the third wheel. You might just be the third wheel, right? Anyone ever experienced that? Yeah? If you go out with a friend and discover uh, his girlfriend's coming along, then you might be the third wheel, right? Have anyone ever been there? No? Okay. If, you've been, if you go out with some friends and they want you to capture the moment and they give you the camera to take the picture, you might be the third wheel, right? Well, sometimes without realizing it, we can make God feel like the third wheel, right? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. And we never want you to uh, feel like the third wheel, uh, Lord. And so we just, uh, we want to just remove that. We bind the devil and, and uh, his schemes in the name of Jesus. And we loosen the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives, the power of relationship in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Right. Well, this series is the Holy Spirit, and it's based on 2 Corinthians 3.17, which says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Right? There's freedom where the Spirit of the Lord is. And so I think more and more Christians really have to get that concept and to really look at that. For the Lord is the Spirit... And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all throughout Scripture, we see the Lord working together, the Lord moving through people's lives. He helps them. He moves and he, he directs them. And Jesus made it a point to describe the helper. He said in John 15, 26 and 27, but when the helper comes... Whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you will also bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. Now, whether you know it or not, when you were young with the Lord, you needed the Holy Spirit, right? You needed the third wheel just to get going. You needed the third wheel to keep balance. You needed the third wheel in your life. And many of us are like kids on their big wheels. Who, who's got a big wheel when they were young? Anyone here got a big wheel? Did you receive a big wheel? Okay, we got a few of them. Remember that feeling? You got on that big wheel and it was like, oh yeah, you got three wheels to roll on, right? So when you were young in the Lord, it was all about those three wheels, right? But as you got older, something happened. Two wheels, you found out, worked just fine. You know, many Christians today think that they just need two wheels. They just need to, the Father and the Son, and that's it. That's all, that's all they need, the Father and the Son. They treat the Holy Spirit like a third wheel. You ever notice that? Have you, has anyone here noticed that before? Yeah? Yeah, so how does the Holy Spirit seem like to you? Does he seem like a third wheel to you? Well, I want to encourage you today to show you the, the three wheels of Trinity throughout Scripture. So we'll start off with uh, the first thing is the Holy Spirit helped in creation. I don't know if many people know that. He helped in creating the world, the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the, the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, 
when we look at this, when you see in the beginning God created, and you go to the Hebrew, and that Hebrew word for God is Elohim, which is the plural noun for God. So there's a, a plural there. That means there's more than one. There's more than one, but there's God. And then the first mention of the more than one or the, the person, one of the people in the Godhead happens to be the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth, right? Over the face of the waters. Again, in Genesis 1.26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There we have again the plural. Then God, that, that Hebrew word for God right there is Elohim. It's the plural noun for God. Amen. We have the plural there. Therefore, it says, let us, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. So right there at the very creation, we see the Holy Spirit is involved, but there's, there's others involved too, right? But we can't forget the Holy Spirit was in, is involved in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And it even says, if you look in uh, Psalms 33, 6 and other places, you know that God created the stars with what? His breath, the roha, you know? And so there's another one. Or he created the stars in the heaven uh, and all the host with the fingers of God. And we know Jesus referred to the finger of God as the Holy Spirit, right? Well, the Holy Spirit has always existed with the Father and the Son. There's the Trinity there. There's, there's the three wheels again. Hebrew 9.14 says this, just think about how much the blood of Christ will pour our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Do you see the Trinity right there? Do you see all three wheels, especially the third wheel, the third person of the Holy Spirit? He's eternal. He's an eternal Holy Spirit. He's existed from the very beginning. And then we see Christ, the Messiah, the Son, who offered himself to God the Father, right? Amen. As a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So we see the Trinity over and over, whether it's Old Testament, New Testament. Do you realize that God didn't make you because he was lonely? He, he didn't make you because he was lonely. He's always had, had company. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always had relationship with each other right from the very beginning. He's always had the fullness of God. So he must have made you for another reason, right? It wasn't because he was lonely. It's because he wants a relationship with you. Not out of loneliness, but out of love for you. Now the Holy Spirit also bears witness with the Son and the Father. In John 5, 31, 32, Jesus said, If I bear witness of myself... My witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So right there, <laughs> Jesus is saying, look, I, I can't testify about how, uh, how great I am and how good I am. I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do that for me. He's the Spirit of truth, and he will... He will witness the truth about me. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he witnesses. He, he glorifies the, the Son, Jesus. He glorifies Him. That's what He does. He, man, you start talking about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is like, okay, all right, yeah, I'm on board. I, I want to glorify Jesus, the Son. I want to glorify the Father. And so He's right there, and He wants to talk about Jesus. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says, when, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, 
this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now you see the three different persons of the Godhead right here at the baptism of Jesus, right? Jesus is getting baptized, not for the repentance of sin, but because he wants to be obedient to the Father and, and go through all and have all righteousness done. So he's baptized, he comes up out of the water, and the Spirit comes down and lands upon him. So we see the Spirit of God coming down and, and landing upon him like a dove. And then the Father's voice speaks from heaven. You see the different areas we're talking about? We got the Father speaking from heaven. My, this is my beloved Son, whom I well pleased. Then we have the Holy Spirit coming down, descending like a dove. And we have Jesus himself there, the Son, being baptized. Right there is the Trinity right there. And that takes three different persons to fulfill that, that setting right there. In 1 John 5, 7, the word says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Amen. These three are one. The Father, the Word, that's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. So to know Jesus and the Father, you must know the Holy Spirit. See, you, people can't come to, uh, to, to the Lord without the Holy Spirit directing them, without the Holy Spirit convicting their heart or convincing them that they need a Savior in Jesus. So it's all through the Bible. It's all the way through, from the very beginning to the very end even. There's, a, there's the, the third wheel we see over and over, the person of the Holy Spirit. And he plays a big role. Now, in Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you'll, you, J Jews have a prayer that they pray, and they continually say this over and over. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. But let me break this down and show you some things with this whole thing where, where people say, well, no, it says the Lord God is one. Well, here, let me break it down. The word Lord right there in the Hebrew is Yehovah, Yehovah. And it's talking about a self-existent or eternal being. Self-existent or eternal being. Yehovah. And then our God, the Hebrew, is that same word, Elohim. Elohim, that's the plural noun for God. So, and then the Lord is one. And that word is ekhad. It means properly united, one, and together. So there's an order, there's a, full, there's a properness to it. There's an order to it. It's not sloppy. It's not like thrown together. You ever, you know, I seen a, a, a pie at the store the other day where it looked like, it literally looked like they dropped it and picked it up and tried to shove it back together because the pieces looked out of place. But let me assure you that the order that God is in and united together, nothing's out of place. Nothing is out of place. He is the Lord our God and the Lord is one. See, Jehovah, Elohim, Echad. There's a, 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 a compound plural to that whole phrase. So you're thinking, well, why do we need the third person of the Trinity? You know, a lot of Christians ask that. Well, why do I need the third person of the Trinity? Well... Because your Christian walk will be incomplete if you ignore the third person that God had. It, actually, if you ignore the third person that God had, you're not going to accomplish very much. You're going to keep falling down. You'll, a lot of people just fade away and they, they leave the faith because they never had a relationship with the third person that God had. The only person of the Trinity 
the Holy Spirit, he's the only person that's on the earth. Do you understand that? He's the only person of the Trinity that's on earth right now today. And he wants a relationship with you, just like the Father and the Son do. And with every relationship, it changes as we mature, doesn't it? Right here. You remember riding those big wheels when you were younger? Well, look at They got all sorts of... There's people that, that make big, big wheels for big kids right there. And so it changes. With every relationship, it changes as we mature. So just like parents' relationship changes with their children as they mature, so will yours with the Holy Spirit. You, know, you might have been riding a big wheel at the very beginning of your walk, of your, of your ride with, in faith, but hey, you know what? There might be a trike waiting for you now, right? Anyone seen a trike? You know, that's what that's called. A, a motorcycle has basically got three wheels, the third wheel. And it's like going from a big wheel to a trike. Do you know two of the biggest reasons people want to ride or to buy a trike? Do you, do you know? And this is, once I say them, it'll, it'll just be, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. The third wheel on the trike offers greater stability and security. The insurance companies actually report lesser, less accidents on people who ride trikes. Why? Because people notice them and see them. They don't, most motorcycle accidents happen because people don't see the rider. They hit the motorcycle, not the other way around. See, no one in a relationship wants to be a third wheel in a sense that they get ignored. You know, when motorcycle riders get ignored, they get hurt. But if you look at the third wheel in a way that helps give us stability and security, then the third wheel becomes very good, doesn't it? It's, a, it, it's necessary. It's, it's like, man, why would you go without the third wheel? So I want to share with you some points about really befriending the person that's the third wheel. And in this case, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, and this is the message. I love this, this version of this scripture. It says, the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus has got amazing grace, don't you think? You look at the woman at the well, you look, you look all the way through the Gospels, you see amazing grace. That's, that's how you're sitting here, amazing grace. And then it says the extravagant love of God. That's the Father. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, right? Man, what a sacrifice. He sent his only begotten son in the world. Imagine how it hurt God, the Father, when he had to punish his son for you and I, where he's seen him just on the cross, suffering and dying, a horrible death there to pay the price for our sin. That's extravagant love, don't you think? And then, here it is, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. There's the Trinity. There's the three wheels. See, why would, why would the Word of God mentioned the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, that we can have an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit if, if we couldn't, or if the Holy Spirit wasn't real, or if it wasn't, if it wasn't so. It's because he wants us to have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? Amen? Amen. So I want to share with you three essentials to an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit, or with any intimate friendship, the first one is you got to have communication. Communication. And communication really, uh, really hinges on, on one part of the communication, and that's the listening part. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, friendship starts with communication. And your ability to listen usually determines the depth of your friendship. You ever notice that? 
you know, you, your good friend, your, real, your best friend, your BFF, uh, that's a person that's, that will listen to you. Even when no one else will, right? Well, the early church listened to the Holy Spirit. That was one of the big characteristics of the, of the early church. They listened to the Holy Spirit all the time. Acts 10, 19, it says, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. See, the Holy Spirit not only told Peter uh, to go with these three men, but he's the one that sent the three men. He's the one that sent them. Why? To bring Peter back to the house of Cornelius, the centurion, and tell him the good news about Jesus. And they all believe Jesus, the Son of God. They believe, they believe the second person of the Godhead because the third person was there. And they listened to the third person of the Godhead. They believe that Jesus died on a cross for their sins and he was raised from the dead. And then when they believed, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit fell on them, just filled the place. His presence was overwhelming, just like being baptized, like going under in the water. It was like water was filling, but it was the Holy Spirit filling the place, and they spoke in tongues and praised God. That's what happens when, when the Holy Spirit starts just filling the place. People can't help but praise God. Well, who they pray? Well, they're praising Jesus. They're praising the Father, right? Just like we were doing during worship. And you know what happened after the Holy Spirit really showed up on these unbelievers or these Gentile believers? Gentile. Then they were baptized with water. They were baptized with water. The Holy Spirit connected them to the church body, even though the Jews in their traditions and everything, weren't even supposed to go to the house of a Gentile. That's what Peter's vision was all about. He's seen all these unclean animals. And the Lord said, eat. Hey, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I, I, I would defile myself. Well, you know what the Holy Spirit is showing Peter in this whole thing? Look, they're not unclean if I show up. They're not unclean. Just listen to me. Sometimes we don't talk to people because we think they're unclean. You ever notice that? They're unclean. We really got a dose of that uh, a few years back with COVID, right? Oh, unclean, unclean, you know. And, and it was like the church got a real dosing of not listening to the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8.29, it says, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the chariot. And then said, overtake the chariot. I like, the, I like the King James Version. Overtake the chariot. And Philip listened to the Holy Spirit, went up to the chariot, led the Ethiopian to the Lord, and guess what happened? Baptized him in the water. Right? You see a pattern here? You see a pattern developing? When we listen to the Holy Spirit, we are more likely to do the will of God. Is there a better way to know the will of God than to listen to the Holy Spirit? Well, some say the scriptures, right? Well, you got to get in the Word. Well, where do you think the Word comes from? It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, Amen. right? The two are always going to line up with each other. They're always going to match. They're not going to conflict each other, right? Because it's the same person. The Word is, is God-breathed. And the Holy Spirit leads us. Well, do you listen to the Holy Spirit or do you interrupt him? You ever hear the Holy Spirit start talking to you? And then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, my show's on. Or the Holy Spirit starts talking to you and, and say, well, wait a minute, I, I just wanted to have uh, one more cookie. <laughs> or the Holy Spirit tells you uh, when you're in line and you've been waiting a while, hey, go back and pray for the person that's in the back. And you, well, I've been waiting here. And you interrupt the Holy Spirit. Has anyone ever interrupted the Holy Spirit here, or is it just me? Yeah? Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it, 
afterwards, you know you weren't supposed to do that, right? I remember, well, I heard this story. I read the story about a man, an old man. He was casually walking along, along a country road with his dog and his mule. I mean, you're casually walking when you got your dog and your mule, right? And suddenly, a speeding truck came around the corner and, and hit him and hit his dog and his mule, and they flew in the ditch, knocking him right, right down. And, man, when all the dust cleared and everything, the, the driver of this truck stopped. And, well, that's where the story begins here. Because the old man took this guy that was driving the truck to court. He decided to sue the, the truck driver for the damages of what happened. And while the old man was on the stand, the defense attorney cross-examined the man and asked him a simple question. I want you to answer yes or no. Did you or did you not say at the time of the accident you were perfectly fine? And the old man responded, well, me and my dog and my mule were walking along the road. And then the defense attorney inter rudely interrupted and said, stop, stop. I, I didn't ask you about your dog and your mule. I just want to know, did you say you were perfectly fine at that time, right after the accident? Well, like I was saying, me and my dog and my mule were walking down the side of the road when this truck well, well, wait a minute. Judge, judge, he is not answering the question, the defense attorney said. Your Honor, he's just not answering the question. Would you please insist on him answering the question? And the judge said, well, wait a minute. I think he's got something to say. Let's just listen and hear him out. So the old man continued. Well, like I was saying... Me and my dog and my mule were walking along the road. And when this truck came speeding around the corner, knocked us in the ditch, and the driver stopped and got out of the truck, he saw my dog was badly injured. So he went back to his truck, and he got a shotgun and walked up to my dog and put it out of its misery. And then he seen my mule had a broken leg. And he was severely injured and couldn't move and was crying out. So he walked up to my mule and he shot my mule. And then he looked at me and he said, are you injured too? And I said, no, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> so are you listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying? Or are you cutting him off before he tells you the whole truth? You know, Jesus said in Revelation 2.7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the whole truth of it. Amen? Now, the first thing was communication, but I'm, I'm going I'm to just let you know the second one is construction. It's constru construction. Work with the Holy Spirit. That's what the construction really is. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, In this work, we work with God. And that means that you are a field under God's cultivation or of you like a house being built to his plan. Now, we must work with God if we want to have our, uh, our work last, right? And we got, we got a build day coming up um, May 14th. Uh, Tuesday, and so if you're available, sign up, the sign-up sheet. We're, we're going to work uh, over at the new building and get some things done. But have you noticed that the Holy Spirit is always looking for people to work with Him? He's always looking for people to work with Him. He goes throughout the whole earth to, to, to strongly support those who, who really surrender and want to work with Him. And after Jesus gave the great commission to his disciples, he, he gave that command, go and preach to all, to every creature, go preach everywhere. They went out, and they preached the good news everywhere. 
And what happened? The Lord worked with them and confirmed his word, right? That's what it says. The Lord worked with them and confirmed his word. Now let me ask you a question. Where was Jesus? You know, after he gave that command to go everywhere and preach the gospel, you know what happened? He ascended up into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. So what Lord was working with them when they were out preaching the word everywhere? It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit worked with them to confirm the word. You know the Holy Spirit is the most awesome person living on planet Earth today? Does anyone know that? He is the most awesome, most loving, most caring, most gentle, peaceful, joyful person there is on planet Earth today. And the early church, they expected the Holy Spirit to work with them from the very beginning. They expected that. It's, it's like when, when you got that big wheel. You know, your parents probably gave you that, and they wanted to be right with you, and they wanted to help you figure that out. They wanted to help you know where the brake was. I, I think that was the commercial on the big wheel commercials. They showed you the brake, and when you hit the brake, you spun around. At least the kids on the commercial did, right? And so they were showing you the brake, you know, so, you know. And so they were right there to work with you. Well, the Holy Spirit is right there. Now, you know, just think about this for a minute. I, think about, imagine the early church. Or imagine the early days of Peter, James, and John. Let's just take those three. Just, just think of them as little kids, little boys on their big wheels. Think about that. That's, that's quite a picture, huh? You probably never thought about that before today, have you? Now, they depended on the Holy Spirit being their third wheel. They didn't try to go on two wheels and ride without the Holy Spirit, did they? And the Holy Spirit works with those who are young in the Lord. Notice, after we work with God, what it says in the Scripture, that he's working on us. He's working on us. Just like the parent working with the kid with the big wheel. They don't know how to drive. They don't know a lot of things about it. But they want them to grow up and mature to where they're moving forward to that, that trike maybe one day, right? And so like a plant growing in the field, he's cultivating us. That's where it moves into in the scripture. Right away, it's, it moves right into talking about we're like a plant being cultivated in the field. We're, we're the field being cultivated. And so we're maturing, we're growing. Then it moves into like a house being built to his plan. God wants to build you up, not tear you down. He wants to make you stronger, not weaker. You know you're a masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. He's working on you. You know, he's working. He hasn't given up on you. Some of you think, oh, you know, if you only knew. Well, God knows, and he hasn't given up on you. Can you agree with this, <laughs> with this statement? I'm not where I started, but he's not finished with me yet, right? Does that hit home for anybody here? I'm not where I started, but he's not finished with me yet. Amen? Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, thank God he's not finished with you yet. <laughs> All right. It's okay to, to joke a little and laugh with the, in the Lord, right? Amen? Uh, I noticed the husband and wives got that a whole lot better than the rest of you. Now, think on the Godhead this way. Think of the Trinity this way. God the Father, he's the architect when it comes to building. He's the one designing the plans. He's, he's got the design. He comes up with all that. Now, God the Son, Jesus, he's the job superintendent. He's the one that's going to make sure the mission is going to get done. And he did. He went all the way to the cross, paid the price for us. Voila. Voila and was raised from the dead, right? And then the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, 
is the one who's working with his hands and his fingers doing the job, right? He's the one working in our midst. So each person has different roles, but they are all one in mind, will, and purpose. They never have a a meeting, a a job meeting, about a disagreement about anything. They are totally on board with everything each other wants to do and say. They're totally together. They are one, perfectly, properly united, compoundly together, working together in will, their nature, their substance, their purpose. Amen? Amen. Now, the next thing for an intimate friendship is connection. you got to have connection, right? Connection. Develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. That's what connection is. You, you, you're not just connecting one time. You want to develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. And like any good marriage, my wife and I have a close, intimate friendship. We have a close, intimate relationship. We've been together for over 34 years. It's hard to believe. I, I just thought about it the other day. I was like, man, that's, that's something else. You know, that's pretty good for, someone, for a couple that met on June 6th, D-Day, right? That's pretty good accomplishment right there. Amen. But we didn't do it by ourselves. Someone uh, once told, uh, told me, dating is when you see the best. Dating is when you see the best in people. Dating is when you see the best. And I said, well, what's marriage? Well, that's the rest. <laughs> but, but our relationship is getting better and better every year, praise God. And it's because we both have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and with each other. And intimate relationships don't happen overnight. They're developed. It takes time to intentionally to develop an intimate relationship like anyone knows. I know what my wife's favorite color is. I know what she likes on her pizza, what she likes to listen to for music, what kind of sports she likes. I know what she likes to do. I know what she likes to do for fun. I know what grieves her. And I know what can make her cry with tears of joy. Sometimes even what... I know what she's even going to say at times. Because we have an intimate relationship. I'm mindful of her desires because we have an intimate relationship. It reminds me of Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Amen? Amen? The Holy Spirit wants us to be mindful of his desires. You know, my wife expects me to know what she thinks. I found that out. I finally figured out. Man, I'm I'm so close to her now. I, I can almost know what she thinks, even when she's not there. And so the Holy Spirit wants wants to be mindful of his desires. He wants all of us to be. To know what grieves him, to know what brings him joy. Jesus said, if you know me, you know my father. Right? If you know me, you know my father. Well, Jesus and the father are not here. They're they're in heaven, right? It's through the Holy Spirit that we know them. Right? The people that know me best know my wife. The people that know Jesus best know the Holy Spirit. The early church really knew the Holy Spirit. And when they didn't hear his voice, they knew how he felt about something. You know, in Acts 15, 28, 29, this isn't in your notes, but it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. When they were telling the new churches that were developing and and being birthed in the Gentile communities what to stay away from and what to do. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Yeah. It's just like I don't need to hear my wife say, say, I don't want you walking across the carpet with muddy boots. I don't need to hear her say that because I already know how she feels about that. She feels pretty strongly about that. 
Or, I don't want you eating that pie that's in the fridge that's marked life group on it. And you know what I say? It seemed good to me and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, but I don't need to hear her say that, right? Because I know how she feels. Just like any intimate friendship, you don't necessarily need to hear his voice. To know what his will is, because you already know how he feels about it. You know what the Holy Spirit feels about that. It seemed good to me, to the Holy Spirit and to me, that I stay away from sexual immorality. Amen? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit that I share the good news with people. Amen? I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me all the time, share the good news, if I just share it. There might be times when there's a particular person, but it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to me. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit that I prayed for the sick to be healed. Right? I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me, hey, uh, you might want to pray for that person that's not feeling good. I already know. But you know what? I listen when he urges me. Amen? Now, to develop an intimate friendship, you got to communicate, right? Communicate. You must listen to. The, the communication, the listening side's really important. And then construct. You got to build. You got to work together. You got to work together to make it, make it work, right? You can't, work to get, you can't work against each other and think everything's going to come out good. You got to work together. And I always just put it this way. The Holy Spirit is my business partner. He, he, he's, he's got 51% of the say. That means I have to listen to him. And so it's like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the last thing is connect. Intentionally develop intimacy. It doesn't happen by accident. You have to intentionally do it. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, let's pray. I just want to ask the question, though. In what way are you making the Holy Spirit the third wheel in your life? Is it a good way or is it the way where you're ignoring the Holy Spirit? And there are, there are people, there's, there's basically three groups of people. People that ignore the Holy Spirit. And there is another group of people that tolerate the Holy Spirit. And then there's people that want to go deeper into an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're that last one with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to raise your hand up. Yeah, I want to go deeper too. Praise God. All right, brother. All right, sister. I want to go deeper. See, some people are listening here. Well, you can, if you don't want to go deeper, then that just means you're just willing to tolerate them or just ignore them altogether. But those who raise their hands and they want to go deeper, let's just pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I want a close relationship with you. I believe you sent your son Jesus to suffer and die on the cross to save me from my sins. So I turn from that way of life and I receive your forgiveness and I make Jesus Lord of my life. I, I give you all access. I believe with all my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead and that you sent me your Holy Spirit that your Holy Spirit talks to me and convinces me. He convinced me that I need a Savior, that I need to walk in righteousness. So help me to listen to, work with, and develop a deeper friendship with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. In your mighty name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. That's what we do, right? We go deeper with the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, right? So let me just bless you. I'm going to give you this blessing from Numbers 6, 24 and 26. And if you notice, it's a trifold blessing. All right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace so that you may walk in the victory 
that the Lord has for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.